Oh, I appreciate it. teaching at five o'clock. Only one. I'm always hungry. <laughs> I just, like, I was good at one o'clock, I was good at three o'clock, then about 15 minutes ago, my stomach started gurgling, I'm like, oh, we need to have this class catered. So seriously, if the university's gonna have us here at five o'clock, they need to cater to class. Go for snacks? Uh, fruit snacks, you want some? Oh, no, thank you. I'm okay, but I'm just like, I can I can go for a PB and J right now. Like that just sounds so good to me. Alright, so welcome to lecture two of the Power Authority and Government series, where we are going to today discuss challenges of power authority and government. Um, so if my math is right, I really haven't done much math to guarantee its accuracy, but um, I'm under the impression that after next week or after today, maybe it's after we are officially halfway through the in-class portion of our semester. I actually think it is today. Today is the halfway point. So by next week, we'll be closer to the end of in-class instruction than we are from the beginning. Um, so just if you don't recall, we end the way we started, and that is on Zoom. So our final topic, our last two weeks will be over Zoom as our first two, uh, as our first topic, first two weeks of work. Um, so then that means that in three weeks, we are halfway through the semester itself. So we are flying by. Um, and that's cool. I mean, we get a really early start of summer, so we're gonna have a really long summer, which in and of itself is always, um, is always acceptable. <laughs> I'm never gonna say no to a long summer. Um, but that also just means that in the event that you find yourself kind of starting to fall behind a little bit. Maybe a couple of assignments aren't, aren't going the way you want them to go. Maybe you, you got busy with work or something, this assignment, whatever it is. Then your grade can start to, which thus leads to your grade beginning to kind of suffer a little bit. Um, I want to just keep us aware that while it is sort of still early, the semester is going to fly by. And the last thing that I want of you guys is for anyone to fall too far behind or mess up. But they get to the point where, you know, in three weeks, they're like, screw it, I'm done, I can't make it. I don't want that. So um, you'll have your assignment graded by, honestly, hopefully tomorrow. Um, if not tomorrow, I'll get it done by the weekend, but like, I'm going to shoot for tomorrow for sure. That's my ultimate goal. And so, you know, hopefully, I mean, how did it go? Is that what well? Any like any problems with it? We're good. Uh, and I hope so. I mean, I, I hope that it's a two degree assignment. Um, and so, uh, if though I mean, you're great at this point, after that assignment, still will be too in. Is it exactly what you want? Reach out to me. You know, just let me know. Let's see what we can do. I want to make sure that you're going to stay on, uh, going to stay on top of this because I guarantee you, I'm, every single one of you can't get an A in this class. I obviously can't promise that everyone can get an A. But I guarantee you that every single one of you guys can get an A in this class 100 percent It's that that is a fact. Um, and so because then I want to work with you to, to help you get there. You obviously have to put in your side of the effort, but I will put in a little bit of effort on behalf of you to help push you to the grade that you want. And if you don't care if you get an A, if you're having B or C, whatever, okay, you know, let's get you there. I just guarantee you that every one of you guys can get an A in this class. So if things after this week, you know, after the second assignment. Um, aren't shaping up the way you want it to be, please, please, please reach out to me. I prefer in person. I prefer that you came before after class and talk to me. Because that way we can like, make adjustments and work on things like right there. But if you feel so compelled, shoot me a text um, and we'll, we'll absolutely talk things through and see what we can do. Cool? Or as the Italians would say, capisce? Um, and then uh, kind of a part two. How are y'all doing? Not good? 
April. You graduated in April? Yeah. Congratulations. You're off. Why is that stressful? It sounds like super exciting. Because I have to like get into my bill and pay back all my loans and all that. Well, okay, so just get into your field. Like, actually, I can kind of help you with that depending on what it is. What is what's your degree? It's what? Social work. Social work. Okay. Well, do me a favor. Stay after class and let's talk. Because um, I don't have any like ins on social work per se, but I can potentially help with this couple things here professionally. Like, we're, I'll start advertising like my assistants in a couple of weeks anyway. But if you're stressing already, let's see what we can do. Okay. B. When it comes to paying off student loans, first off, in a normal year, you have six months to wait before you have to file. You either have to make a first payment or file for first extension. But we're in COVID, where right now everything is on pause. My loans are on pause from 10 years ago. Um, so uh, you kind of have our pre right there, B. And then three, masters. I mean, are you going to try to jump right into that? or? No, no. Okay, well, yeah, then you can take a break. I mean, it's so hopefully then that doesn't like came over your head too much. But um, I can also say it as a almost two time master's graduate in it. It's really not. It's it's just kind of more of this. It's yeah. just more focused. You know, I mean, you just the way I've always explained college and each level of degrees is like a funnel. You know, your BA is it's just a lot of stuff. Your master's degree really starts to focus in pretty hard, and then the PhD focuses in like you just pick one aspect of whatever it is that you discuss in masters, and you pick that for you know, all you've got. So it's just more of this, just more focused. You know? So. Don't get stressed. It's gonna be fun. How about who? How's everybody else? Doing? How are we doing? Good. You're you're also like, uh, what's wrong? What's up? Oh, just health issues. Oh uh, well. Sorry. <laughs> are you okay? Are you doing good? Yeah, I just have some sorts of time where like sure. it just everything adds up, like being anemic and having tachycardia and also being a cancer. I have tachycardia. Do you? Yeah, I've actually had surgery on my heart. Twice. Oh, yeah. I, so the first time I was 18, 18 um, every time I stood up, I almost passed out. I felt like I was having many heart attacks. I would have one or two of those miniature heart attacks every single day. Um, my heart would stop. If I ever got my heart rate up, as it was slowing down, it would take a break in the process of slowing down. Just, and I would feel literally feel the blood settle in my feet, and then my heart would kick back up and go. Nope, I'm still here. And I would always feel like super weird. Uh, in fact, the first time, so I feel like I had my heart was doing some really funky things. And my mom took me to a cardiologist and they put me on a treadmill and had all these things on me. The cardiologist and his wife was his primary RN nurse. You know, they're just like chatting with my mom as I'm now resting and my heart beat is being, um, you know, put, put on a speaker. You know, they're, they're watching and listening, but they're just chatting. You know, it's, Kind of small talk because I just listen to my heart. And all of a sudden, my heart stops. And it's not an exaggeration when I say this. It's not like skip, it stops. And my cardiologist stopped the conversation and I quote, Oh my God. And, and my mom was like, Well, that was reassuring. So I had my first heart surgery at 18, just literally weeks later. Then Two years ago, my heart started to do some really funky things again, and um, I'm really sharing a lot with the world here. <laughs> um, and I felt like it, only this time, I felt like it was going to physically explode out of my chest. And it, I really felt it at night when I was going to bed. I, I mentioned that to my cardiologist then. I was like, you know, why do I feel it so much at night? He goes, well, it's because you're resting. Like you can kind of feel everything here more because you're not doing anything. So it's like. You know, but it is doing it all day. You just can't notice it because you're active, you know, thinking about your heart. Like, okay, well, it was so bad it led to insomnia because I felt like it was going to stop when I was asleep. I really felt like, well, if I fall asleep, it's just going to go nuts and, and I'm never going to wake up. And it freaked me, freaked me out. Um, the second time, actually, freaked me out way more than the first time. Here's the crazy thing. I go to this cardiologist, he signs me with a surgeon, he goes, you know, okay, let's let's get this done again. And so we're now in that kind of preliminary meeting, and this guy 
very nice, but very flippantly says, yeah, well, it's not going to kill you. This is just quality of life because you can have it or not. And I'm like, really? It's like, yeah, I mean, your heart's not really beating too many times. If my heart was overbeating, it was doing some stuff it's not supposed to. But it's like, it's not going to kill you. You know, you'll be fine. I know you feel like hell, and I did. But it's like, it's just quality of life. You'll feel better. That was reassuring. I'm like, okay. So I had it, and I thank God I did because I feel so much better. But I felt like every single time I was going to die. I was not going to look up. It was the scariest bloody thing I could have ever, ever had. So I pray for you, and I pray that everything is going to be fine. I, I'll just say that, you know, having done it twice, it was a lot less scary the second time than it was the first because it's, it's pretty much outpatient now. So that's, at least they've got that. That kind of procedure, like really well ironed out. Okay, so health issues, end of school year. Um, I'll, I bring it up just because I've had a number of students who have been very, very stressed because of school. Um, you know, hey, we're, we're living in the middle of the bloody pandemic. Here. And like, this is, it's still strange to me that we're here. I'm not against it or anything. I feel very comfortable. Don't get me wrong. It just feels weird that we're in the middle of the pandemic in which. We are facing what Donald Trump called an invisible enemy. And yet here we are among people who could kill us, <laughs> if you think about it. Um, and so that has been getting a lot of students. I totally get it. Um, and then you compile that with um, the traditional stresses of school and the traditional stresses of health and just the traditional stresses of life, relationships, friendships, family, work, yada, yada, yada. And having to live through a pandemic at the same time just can sometimes become a little overwhelming. So I don't say this to be dark or negative in any way. I am a very happy, upbeat, positive person. I feel very good, praise God. And to that, I want to share. Um, if you need to talk to me about anything, like literally anything, I don't care. Please just don't hesitate to, to ask. Just reach out. Um, I like to say that God gave me big ears for a reason. I'll listen. If that's all you need, I'll listen. Um, if you know if school is just driving you nuts and you've got nobody to rant to because everybody else is having the same problems and you just feel like you're talking to the wall, talk to me. You know, I, I just understand that I will totally, totally listen. Um, if uh, you know, and you know, sometimes you've got a problem, you just can't share it with your best friend, you just can't share it with your sister, or you know, your, when I say sister, just mean family. It's totally fine. I mean, if you need to talk to somebody, you don't want to talk to, just reach out to me. Obviously, I'm here in person with you so I can stay after class. If you did talk, and I've done it a number of times this semester already, I will, you know, I'll hang with you. Um, and then if you look, really just need to shout in a long text, shoot me a text. Shoot me a text. I'll, you know, and if you say, please don't respond, I just need to say this out loud, fine. You know, but if, if you've got something, you've got questions, you've got something, just let me know, I'll respond. I'll totally. So just, you know, this is kind of a tough time sometimes for, for some of us. If you need me, I'm here. If not, God bless. I mean, like, great. You're, you're like me, you don't need to complain. Beautiful, but if you do, I got your back. So, on that note, any other questions, comments, concerns, questions, questions, any kind? All right, you guys, the best is rock and roll. So, halfway through, challenge of power and authority in government. Today, we're going to describe the evolution of the sources of political legitimacy. Hopefully, you guys watched the first lecture, hopefully, because you need those points, in which we identified the sources of political legitimacy. We're going to, we're going to examine how they expanded. Now, real quick, I do want to offer that one last thing. Uh, Quick sidebar about watching. So just also remember when I was bringing up grades earlier, at the end of the semester, every single semester, I will have a student or 10 who come to me and say like, hey, I'm 12 points away from a blank grade. And you know, very often it's something like a B plus to an A minus or an A minus to an A. Um, and I'm like, you know, everything is turned in, grades are submitted, like it's, it's we're done. And they come to me like, you know, hey, I'm so close. Is there anything you can do to bump me up to that next letter grade? And before the semester ends, there are opportunities for me to help you out, which is why I was asked, you know, offered at the very beginning, like, please come and talk to me. Your grade is coming. You know, it's not exactly where I want it to be. But when it gets to the end of the semester, it becomes a lot more difficult. The problem, though, that I will run into one to ten times a semester is that somebody will come to me 12 points away, 18 points away from a grade going, man, I'm this close. I'll look over their attendance, and they missed eight classes. You know, they missed four classes. And, like, there is your 20 points for those four classes you missed, or your 40 points for those eight classes you missed. And I get that right now because we're split. You know, it's a little bit easier to show up to a 10 class than it is, I think, to watch online. I get that. There's just something about like, you're at home, you don't have to leave. 
You don't necessarily want to turn on a computer. You want to play a video game. You want to go to sleep. You want whatever. You pick up a shift. I get that. Understand though that those are attendance is free points. The university is showering you with these points, and you might really want to think about taking advantage of it as many as you can because it will, I guarantee you, for most of you, make a difference between one letter grade and the next. And so, and all you have to do is just show up, and all you have to do is just send me your notes, your what say use, or your you know, you are blended and you're good. So just please keep that in mind. Um, you know, again, just a couple of minutes class. If you miss a class here and there, it's totally fine. I'm not going to judge you. It's, you know, whatever. You don't even have to tell me that you're missing class. But just understand, I understand it can become a habit because it can become comfortable to just, oh, I won't, you know, I won't do world history at five o'clock on Tuesday because I'm hungry every week. And you miss a lot of points and you might still do okay in the class. You don't, probably still get it a C and if that's what you're fine with, cool. But think about if you just attended, not only are you in a better place to get that A, like I guarantee you can get but those missed points right there. That's all it. So just keep that in mind. Today we're going to describe the evolution of the source of political legitimacy. Let's talk in our role. Uh, I got to skip the review just because again, I know that, you know, some of you guys didn't watch the lecture and I don't want to just, you know, I don't want you sitting there going, I have no idea what we're talking about. We'll get You'll understand at least this. This is the most important. What is political legitimacy? Everything else, you know, good luck on the assignment because we're going to talk about all these guys, but that'll force it to go back and let's look this over. So, challenges to absolutism. So, first up, what is absolutism? Um, it is the idea that for governments, there can only be one central formal entity. It is uh, it's absolute authority, but absolute authority doesn't have to be the individual. So, when we think of absolute authority, in terms of a dictatorship, that is one thing from absolute authority in terms of a democratic republic like the United States is. So in the United States, we have absolute, the, our federal government has absolute authority, even though it is more than one person. Where political legitimacy comes in, so that, that other word that we need to have defined real quick, where that comes in is when a government is legitimate. They are the reigning, ruling entity. And there are five ways that it can happen. I'm not going to give them those fives. They're again in the Tuesday lecture. If you didn't watch it, you're going to have to look back and answer the questions for the assignment. But the American entity is how the American government has political legitimacy is because we voted for them and we told those people, you're in charge. That's it. Therefore, the government is legitimate because we told them they are. They didn't take it from us. They weren't placed there. We said, you're in charge. You're the government. Thus, you are legitimate, and from that, they hold and wield significant power. So, absolutism is the concept there's just one where we can get into a conflict where we lack absolutism and we lack political legitimacy is when there is potentially a competing government or a standing government is in serious question that they actually hold legitimate power. So, I have one very small but very recent. You know, not answer but example, and that is in that about a month, that month after the election, 2020 election, in which Trump and a lot of Republicans, a lot of questioned whether or not the election results of Biden's victory were in fact accurate, honest, and true. For about a month or so, it called into question the legitimacy of Biden's election. We saw the numbers that said he won. But there are a lot of people and pieces of evidence that people were bringing to the forefront saying this is showing that his Biden's election is illegitimate. So had those questions remained in full and Biden takes office and Trump remained actively pursuing in some way overturning, overthrowing, what have you, that would have meant that the United States government would have lacked or you know, begin to lack political legitimacy. Why Trump can't do that and why the Biden administration now has full political legitimacy is simply because there are no more pushes for overturning. Not only that, but nothing has actually happened to show there was a question. If even one state, just say Arizona, if one state had taken the previously solidified results of Biden winning and proven corruption, proven poor voting practices, proven you know, whatever, and the state flipped to Trump, even though that one state, Arizona alone, would not have pushed Trump back in the White House, that would have given pause. 
because then if other states that were previously in question then decided, well, we're still not going to do the kind of forensic audit that Arizona's doing, then there would have been question, and that would have hurt Biden's political legitimacy. But none of that ever happened. We never got that. It never came to pass. We can blame whoever we want, governors, state legislatures, judges, judges they want to trump out, whatever, that's irrelevant. The relevant aspect to it is we have one government, it's the Biden-led, well, it's the Biden-led uh, executive branch, but then we've also got the Pelosi, Schumer, McConnell-led um, executive branch, and of course we've got the, the um, Supreme Court. But if we're looking at kind of from one context, we have the Biden-led government, nothing else, there's no competing governments. Therefore, the federal government holds political legitimacy at its foundation, and it is an absolute government. There is only one, there's no com competing governments, that sort of thing. So, that introduction aside, let's start with the first, what say you? Is selfishness evil? So I have these two definitions from uh, Webster's Dictionary. The definition of evil is morally reprehensible, sinful, wicked, and evil impulse, and arising from actual or imputed bad character or conduct of a person, an example would be of evil reputation. Then the definition of selfish is concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself, seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage, pleasure, or well-being without regard for others, and arising from concern with one's own welfare or advantage in disregard of others. So, is selfishness evil? I'm going to go to drink water real quick. So, social distance up neighbors. I just said go. Yeah. Yeah. Selfishness has two sides to it. So you can be selfish in the right way, where you're trying to survive in your own belt, but the first is in lines in a stressful situation. Or the bad way, where it's like you have so much food, and the person's like, Can I have a piece of bread? And they're like, No. Yeah. It's more it's more of a bad habit. Yeah. Like it's more of like a bad personality trait than evil. But it can be a sign of evil. It's not necessarily the root of evil. I think if the word if greed was up there, then it would be evil. And the greed is hoarding everything all for itself and power. It's all it looks like. <laughs> I, don't, I haven't come back here since. I have <laughs> So as a roller, So are you guys a club or we're it's not like an actual club. Sure, sure. Two This year, nobody has ever done that. Oh, yeah, you're That's awesome. Well, you usually lose. Well, okay, fine. But I mean, it's just pretty good. But. That's awesome. I have no idea. Most people don't. Most people don't. 
Yeah. They're fun games to go to. I bet. So wait, do you, where do you play? Uh, you know where Arcadia is? Yeah. We play at the Ashford. Oh, okay. It's like 15 to 20 years. So are you guys part of the fight this year? Uh, we're a little practicing. Nobody else is playing, so we can't really have games. Yeah, you can't just play 18 games in the state of the Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to pass it back. Oh. You're fine. All right, so these will be your placards. I don't know most of your games. I'm still trying to get them up. So you can please fold these hot dog, not hamburger, meaning lengthwise, not widthwise. And then please put your name big and bold. Please make it bold. You know, bright, wide, whatever. First name and last initial. And then please write it on both sides. And the reason for this is not only so I can see it in front of you, but also the people behind you can see it. Because uh, obviously, as we have experience, we have a, lot of, a whole lot of discussions, and I want people to be able to kind of like glance over at your, if they don't know your name. Off the top of their head, glad someone can back and be able to reference. Oh, you know, Johnny said this. I don't want a whole bunch of like, she, she said, you know, that's kind of rude. Let's know each other's names. So, write your name big and bold on both sides, first name, last initial, and then write small on the bottom corner of just one side, world history, five o'clock, just small. That's just in the event that you forget it here, I know, you know, who to give it back to. Because you'll be taking this, just so you know. I meant to give you give you guys these last week, and I left them in my car after lunch. I was like, oh man, like, I have to wait a whole other week to. Can you read this? I can if you wouldn't mind filling it in. Right. Uh, and also, be creative if you want. You know, if you want to be colorful and want to jazz it up in any way, I don't care. Um, do it alone. If it's yours. Make it, make it an extension of you. If you want to keep the same, I don't care. Playing, I don't care. All right, well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. A couple of you guys are still trying to help me on the moment. Have you guys ever been in a classroom here and had a bird fly in the window? Not a bird fly in the window. Oh, man. It's happened to me twice. Not in this room, but I just, one just flew by. But it's like, it's like a bomb going. Because they, they, they hit them hard. It's goosh. You know, and then you're like, it's a jarring moment. I've had that happen up in the house once. Yeah. It happened in my apartment. My my master bedroom, and it's a small window. It's not even that big. And it's also covered. I mean, it's, it's under a overhead. I'm like, how the heck a bird? Managed to hit my window, but my son and I were were in my room, and I mean, like I said, it's like an explosion. Uh, but the, I mean, if I recall correctly, like I heard when it hit, because I wasn't looking at the window, but like it hit, we both went, "What?" But then the bird also like yelped or screamed or like I think it really hurt. So it was the sound of the, you know, the screech of it that was like, "Oh, that was a bird." And when you walk, when we walked up to the window, no exaggeration, it left a full body imprint. Like it hit like this with the feathers up, full body imprint. And we were both just like amazed. It was almost like a chalk outline of a dead body on the street. It was the strangest thing. Um, I mean, strange, kind of cool. Obviously sad, but you know, it's it's nuts. It's just weird. All right, Sam Nadara, love that one. Notice that earlier. All right, so what say you? What did you guys say? Is selfishness evil? He's got a strong opinion on this. Who wants to say yay or nay? 
I'll take a nap. Just let me know when you're ready. Come on, nobody. There we go, Jake. Kick us out, bro. Um, I don't think it's necessarily evil. I think evil's a kind of stretch. Um, I think it's like inconsiderate. Um, okay. I think I also think of too when we say evil. I think of like truly evil acts, and I don't see selfishness being up there with that. Okay. How come? How come? Yeah. Um. I would say because when I think of selfishness, I think of like smaller, less, I guess less harmful acts. So when I think of evil, I think of like genocide, terrible things like that. But with selfishness, I don't necessarily think that. I think of not wanting to share something, keeping something for yourself. Okay. What else? Eric. Okay, so we all kind of like agree that it's all based on perception and like how you can see that because. Once one person can say, like, oh, if you're going to step on somebody's toe or something, like, you know, start to, like, rise above and, like, you know, get that, like, promotion or get more money, whatever that issue is, you know, whatever it is, like, that's evil. Then, from, like, another perspective, you can say, like, for example, I brought up the, um, the plane example, like, if you have your ear about walking in that first, you want to be else, like, you have to do it for yourself first, like, others. Mm -hmm. So, it's, like, either or, I mean, look, it's, it depends on the situation. Well, so that one I wouldn't, I, I understand what you're trying to illustrate there with the plane thing, but the reason for that is because you will pass out in a matter of seconds. And so if you're struggling to help somebody else put theirs on and you both pass out, then nobody lives. Whereas if you guarantee yourself, then you can help someone else and you both. So that one isn't like a, hey, fend for yourself. That's a, no, you're both going to pass out. If everybody passes out, then you all die. It's save the people who can most, you know, save yourself because you can most quickly help yourself and then help others because if you pass out, and it's really focused on like children. You know, don't help your child first because if you're in the strong physical point, this, all of a sudden, if you can't get it on and you pass out, that kid ain't good for both dead. Whereas if you can get yours on, even if that kid passes out, you can reoxygenate. So that's it's that's less selfishness and that's more just order of, of saving, I suppose. What else? Wait. I think it like those definitions of selfishness and evil, how it's about like being without regard for others. If you see that as like it's bad character trait or bad conduct, then maybe see it as bad what? Uh like it's bad character or bad conduct, then it would be evil. Something for themselves, and one does something without regard to others, then they could see it as evil. And then the person okay, so you're saying, that in terms of, of personal opinion, that somebody might not think it is evil, or that somebody might not think they're being selfish, and thus maybe because of their perception, it might not be evil. Right, to them, but then to the person on the outside looking at it, they might okay. attribute it to be a good factor. So to that argument, though, I mean, let's go, we can thankfully have this kind of conversation with the Christian university. That isn't what Christ says, though, and that isn't what, what the Christian faith kind of uh, implies about, about sin in general. It isn't interpreted. It was, it was interpreted by Christ and our churches kind of now continue that practice. So if somebody says, let's say for the sake of argument, I steal a cookie from you. Um, I'll just keep it simple. But I go, it's not, it's not, you know, I'm being selfish, whatever. That's not how I see it. You would get an extra cookie and I want one. Does that mean I'm right? No. Oh well, no. It still would be evil, but okay, it still would be evil. They would see it as that. Like, so sure, maybe I don't see it as because I'm an idiot, but it's still evil. Yeah. Right? Yes. So that is there by that logic. Any variation in selfishness or or evilness, or is it just straightforward? Thus is selfishness evil. Yeah. Okay, so we 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 are coming we agree that selfishness is or not that we agree, excuse me, but like we can 
become that solid answer. So I have a question. If you were to steal a dollar from your neighbor, you know, you pay a dollar on your desk, I'm talking right now, you know, but people next to you, there's a dollar on their desk and you took it. Is that selfish? I mean, it's their dollar, you just stuff it in your pocket yourself. Is that selfish? Yes. Is that even? Going to Jake, uh, you know, take them the conception of potential variations. I mean, is it evil to steal a dollar? It's not evil to steal a dollar. It's one dollar. One dollar. I mean, it's Faith's last dollar. It's all she had. It's still not evil. I think the implications of her last dollar are evil. I mean, that, that means her, that means no food. That means no. Rent. Okay, what if she had two bucks? And you still one dollar. I mean, it's still her dollar. Why, whether or not it's her last or not, matters. I think it can be considered to be like cruel or disrespectful. We can certainly add additional definitions, maybe, but does it take away from the fact that it was still selfish? It's still thievery, and it's therefore evil. What if you're stealing that dollar for your like dying son? Did you watch Spider-Man 3? Yeah. Okay, that is the stupidest argument for a villain I've ever heard. <laughs> My kid is sick, and so I'm stealing and killing. No, that, that never has that logic ever worked. Christ didn't say kill to judge. They're like, that's never been, it's, it's a, and no offense, Jess. That's just, just like such a, what if it's because, so you ask for the dollar, you know, and if, Faith is only to give up the dollar, then you go to Noah, you, you raise up a collection. There are a whole bunch of people, you know, who, who you can ask for help from. You can ask the church, that's the other important thing. Churches are supposed to be positions of generosity, but, you know, bastions of generosity. But, okay, so if it's her last dollar, it's evil. If she has two dollars, is it still evil? I think that even though, like, either way, it's like a pretty small thing. It still fits under like, the definition. Are yeah. people? Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that is what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. No, no. <laughs> the other I'm just saying, that, so, is, that is my point. Like, that argument, um, yeah. even though it's a little bit, I think if you don't like to use the word people for little things very much, because it sounds so extreme when you say it. Uh -huh. um, but, but it still fits under the definition. Thus, let's jump it up a notch. Faith has a million bucks. You're the wealthiest person in this classroom, I think. But no, I don't. She still leaves a dollar on her desk. It is still her dollar. And you don't have a dying kid. You steal that dollar. Is it selfish? Is it evil? Uh, it's like long. I don't know. I guess going on with do you call we call that evil and like I don't know what we call it when you're talking about it like genocide and things like that, but we use the word in the same category. I still know that's evil, so is like well. Okay, yeah, so this is an A and I suppose I mean I think there's a fair argument for for styles of evil. But if selfishness is selfishness and selfishness is evil, then evil is evil. So, yes, I mean, there is a difference in selfish, okay, so Faith, you're a wonderful person, I would never do this to you. But let's say for the sake of argument, in order to get that dollar, I murdered her first. I had to go to the extreme because the genocide response. But either way, I am taking that dollar. Now, I might have committed two acts of selfishness, two acts of evil, and one might argue that the loss of a life is more valuable than the loss of that dollar, but in the end, I still stole the dollar, and I, you know, and I stole her life, they are both inherently evil. So, yes, I mean, stealing a dollar and genocide, they're different variations on a theme, but if they're both caused by the, by the concept of selfishness, you know, then evil is evil. I'll even, I'll put it like this, and again, this is a conversation I can only have at a Christian university, so I thank God that I'm here. If I were at ASU, I'd be scoffing, yell at, but 
Satan smiling either way. Now, if you think about it, the one who really put a Christian bent on this discussion is Satan smiling when you saw that dollar. And is he smiling when you commit genocide? He's, you know, it's still something, though, that is a separation from what Christ called us to be. So regardless of the variation on the theme, if selfishness is evil, then regardless of the scope, you've committed, it's, it's evil. I'm not saying that you're an evil person. I'm saying you've committed an evil act based on a selfish attitude. Eric, are you going to say something or no? I thought I saw you. No. All right. So let's look at where this goes. All right. So just a preface to the following slide. I'm going to reference a papal bowl. I need to just explain what a papal bowl is very quickly. This is a papal bowl. Okay, get it? No, I'm just kidding. So a papal bowl is a, 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 a type of a seal that a pope would place at the end of a letter to authenticate that this letter came from him. So that way there was no confusion that somebody else wrote it and said it was the Pope. That seal is evidence that the Pope himself put the seal on that letter, you know, stated that this was me. So it's literally this lead um, seal that you would just, you pour wax on, the, you, you know, close the letter up and you seal the letter with wax and then you place your stamp on it to say, I wrote this. So the Pope had his own special one. You, you know, you figured that somebody of authority would have their own that wasn't duplicated to prove that, yes, I stand by this letter. So this um, was the Papal of Alexander IV. We're not going to talk about it the rest of the day, but just so you can see one, this is just the Joseph defined to decide, to, to define the one Papal. So, does that make sense? Cool. Does anybody, by the way, does anybody have a seal just like for fun? You've got a, like a is it for you or your family? Like, that's so cool. My sister bought one for her kids. She homeschools them, and so they do like so many more creative things that you would do in public school. And that's one of the things that she did. So now, when they write letters, she bought the special candle, pour the wax, and they seal it. And it's just like you know, it's, I'll admit, we're talking twenty twenties. It feels kind of goofy, but then when you see it, it's like. Still pretty cool. Like, I mean, that, you're you're really harkening back to a time when that was a thing. Um, if you guys have ever seen, not necessarily in person, but seen images of the Peace of Paris, which is when the United States formalized, finalized their peace with Great Britain. So that was the official end of the war. That's got multiple seals on it. They actually, what they used to do is they would put a. Um, uh, it's like a, it's not a string; it's a ribbon. They put a, a ribbon down and then seal the ribbon on a piece of paper and put their, you know, seal it down with wax and put their stamp on. So you have three layers essentially of ribbon, wax, and then the seal imprint on it. And so the uh, that's my favorite kind of historical use of it. But it was the American Revolution? It, it well, excuse me. It was the uh, Peace of Paris uh, to formally end the American Revolution. So, in his papal bull of uh, 1520, Pope Leo X said of Martin Luther, quote, arise, well, not said of Martin Luther, but said uh, in response to Martin Luther's um, kind of reformation thought. Arise, O Lord, and judge thy cause. A wild boar, Martin Luther, has invaded thy vineyard. And the vineyard being his church. Arise, O Peter, and consider the case of the Holy Roman Church, the mother of all churches, consecrated by thy blood. Arise, O Paul, who by thy teaching and death hast illuminated and dost illumine the church. Arise, all ye saints, and the whole universal church, whose interpretations of strict of scripture has been. A sail. So he's calling out God of all the dead to come and stop Martin Luther because Martin Luther is questioning the interpretations of scripture that the church has held for 1500 years. 
sort of, we'll get into that in a second, but essentially that's what Pope Leo X is saying. To which Martin Luther replies a year later, quote, it truly seems to me that if this fury of the Romanists, that being the Catholic Church, uh, should continue, there is no remedy except that the emperor, kings, and princes, girded with force and arms, should resolve to attack this plague of all the earth, no longer with sword, with words, but with the sword. He is literally calling for war against the Catholic Church. If we punish thieves with the gallows, robbers with the sword, and heretics with fire, why do we not all the more fling ourselves with all our weapons upon these masters of perdition, these cardinals, these popes, and all this sink of Roman sodomy this, that ceaselessly corrupts the church of God and wash our hands in their blood so that we may free ourselves and all who belong to us from this most dangerous fire. It's pretty important that he's calling for war and he's metaphorically saying that they need to bathe the blood of these church leaders. They must die. They must be martyred on behalf of Christ. It's a pretty huge call of arms to make. So who was Martin Luther? Well, he was an accidental revolutionary. He had no intention of starting any new denominations. That was never his goal. He did it. He accepted that position once he realized he had, once he believed he had no other cause of action. Um, in fact, four months after he kind of started the new faith, the new denomination of of what ended up being called Luther's, and he got married, like he moved on right quick. And, and as a monk in the Catholic Church, there's no marriage. You are married to the church. That's that's part of the, the gig there. Um, and so he, once everything kind of goes out of control, and he is kicked out, and a number of followers, you know, are willing to accept that kind of like, hey, let's get out of here. This isn't working for us. Then he starts a revolution that he never intended. Uh, or excuse me, he, he kind of finishes a revolution that is that he never intended on actually starting. So he was a German Augustinian monk who taught at the University of Wittenberg in Germany. That's redundant, sorry. Uh, in 1517, Luther felt compelled to speak up against papal abuses. You know, papal abuses be uh, those of the leadership of the Pope of the Church. And Pope Leo X, specifically, he was calling against Pope Leo X for using the sale of indulgences to build the new church of St. Peter. So if you guys don't know, what is... Oh, oh, so, and so he posts the 95 Thesis uh, on October 31st, 1517. I, I thought that, that was the anniversary. On the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg. Uh, 95 Thesis because he had 95 complaints. And he protested the impression that indulgences actually remitted or forgave sins and released the dead from punishment in purgatory. So um, we'll get into it again in a second, but an indulgence was a was a paid salvation. It was this, it was a literally monetary salvation. Uh, and so Luther believed such claims turned salvation into something that could be bought and sold, almost like an item in a supermarket. And so he said, if I profess the loudest voice and clearest exposition, every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point at which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing him. So what he's saying is like, if I were to state that everything that I claim to be wrong right now is right, and if I agree with the whole wealth and scope of the church on every other level, but I continue to disagree on this, and or even though I disagree on this one little sliver, I now come to agree because what good am I doing? I'm not doing any good. Um, I am not confessing Christ, no matter how boldly I am uh, professing him, because I am standing against Christ by not fixing this issue. Where the battle rages, he continues, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved, and to be standing on a battlefield besides is, is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. So he's illustrating, here's the battlefield, this issue of indulgences, you know, as part of his 95 issues. That is the battlefield. If I flinch, 
if I quit, if I walk away, if I accept defeat, then I am nothing more than a coward. He goes, then I am not a soldier of Christ. I am but a coward on the battlefield. And then he feels that my soul is lost. He, he feels in this moment that he's standing up for Christ and nothing more. So what was an indulgence? And how was it? Well, indulgence, like I said, was a payment um, of penalty imposed by priests on penitents as a work of sanctification for a mortal deadly sin. Well, a mortal sin is pretty simple in its definition, its explanation. It is basically, there are mortal sins and there are venial sins. A, venial, a, a mortal sin is when you physically place something between you and God. And when you do that, you have now broken off, you know, not literally, but essentially, you've kind of broken off your relationship with God, and you run the risk in that moment of death of missing out on the opportunity of heaven. A venial sin is something smaller. So um, a venial sin, so, okay, I shouldn't say something smaller. What is a mortal sin? Well, a mortal sin is obviously things like murder. You know, it's things like um, pornography. It's things like premarital sex. It's things like rape, um, child abuse, you know, those kinds of physical things. Those are, you know, they're traditionally things that are called uh, skins of the flesh. Those are mortal sins. You practice those. You have separated yourself from God. And that in and of itself is, in that moment, you uh, risk your eternal life at that moment. A venial sin is something much smaller. It's, you know, your mom said, you know, you can't have a cookie before dinner and you snuck one anyway. It's like, I mean, yeah, obviously you're sinning, you're technically stealing, you know, and selfish too. It's just considered, you know, those kind of little things. It's like, it's just those kind of sidebar sins. Those are called venial. You still have to confess, they're still sins. They're still worthy of punishment by God, obviously. He wants to be perfect. He's calling us to, to be as Christ-like as we possibly can. But they don't reach that level of mortal in which you're truly separating yourself from God. So according to medieval theology, after priest, the priest abolished the penitent's guilt, you do that for confession. You go to a priest, you still do this to this day, it's one of, uh, one of the sacraments. You go to confession and you do express all your sins. The priest in that, uh, has the ability at that point to um, absolve you of your sins, to clear your conscience, and to place you back on this path of, of um, grace with Christ. And then in the end, you're given a penance, which is traditionally some prayers. You know, maybe if your sins kind of fit some sort of biblical theme, he'll ask you to, you know, read and kind of, um, uh, you know, really kind of think about a particular passage of the Bible. Or maybe it's just, you know, some prayer, like say, an Our Father, Hail Mary, or, or you know, but just something like that. It's, it's traditionally pretty straightforward. You know, it's just that last little, you know, you're kind of kneeling before God and saying, God, I'm truly sorry for my sins, um, and I will not repeat them. That is, that is also part of it. You have to be honest with both yourself and the priest. And so let's say it's something like pornography. Yeah, it's a really big deal. But if you confess it with the intention of continuing, then you've confessed nothing. You know, you've been absolved of nothing. So once absolved, that eternal penalty was reduced to a magical work of salvation. Oh, I apologize. I didn't finish this one. So according to medieval theology, after a priest absolved the penitent's guilt, the penitent still remained under eternal penalty, a punishment God justly imposed for those sins. So the priest can say, yes, you're guilt, you can be guilt free. God is aware of your intentions, but you're still going to go to hell. That's kind of what the priests were saying at this point. And the church was allowing them to say. So once absolved, that eternal penalty, though, could be reduced by money by an indulgence to a magical work of salvation, the penitent, penitent might be for here and now, like extra prayer, like fasting, almsgiving, focus, that kind of thing. But you bought off a bunch of that, that uh, punishment. So originally designed for those in the Crusades in the 16th century, indulgences were dispensed for cash payments and could be used to include Future sins. That's that was also something else that was kind of guilty with this was hey, I'm not gonna commit sins, so I'm gonna give an extra 50 bucks, you know, and so that way I know I'm good when I do it. Um, and then those also of their dead relatives presumed to be stranded in purgatory. 
So the famous indulgence peddler, Johann Tetzel, who was particularly authorized by Pope Leo X to sell indulgences, used to say on the streets, literally, quote, as soon as a coin of a coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Of course, many people, including the poor, suffered as a result of the selling indulgences. These people are poor, they commit sins, they confess their sins, the priest tells them you're going to hell unless you pay us. So what do they do? They give the other none of And we're enticed by the idea of not only a quicker avenue to heaven, uh, the poor were also encouraged to spend money on a religious luxury they could not afford. Each of the early reformers, those who side with agreed with, worked with Mark Luther, faced significant opposition from the church, as well as secular rulers and even their own communities. This initial skepticism, or the initial skepticism of these groups, quickly gave way to more hostile reactions, which included excommunication. Excommunication is actually when you, as a Catholic, commit one of those mortal sins and are thus separated from God and pull, you basically remove yourself from being able to accept communion. So, very quickly, what is communion? It is literally the body and blood of Christ, as it occurs through transubstantiation. It is a, um, um, a mimicking, a replication of the Last Supper, where Christ literally said, you must eat my body and drink my blood to reach eternal salvation. So through transubstantiation, priests do this in mass. If you are not in a state of grace, if you have committed a mortal sin and have not confessed it and you receive, it's a really big deal. It's a really bad thing. So you're not supposed to. If you committed a mortal sin, you're supposed to hold off on receiving. You're supposed to still go to church. You're the Ten Commandments is go to church every Sunday. But you're supposed to hold off from receiving because God cannot enter a temple that is not in a state of grace. Um, also, people are being shunned to, or to an extreme cases, being put to death. Financing their movements was also an issue as these people required patronage of the state. You know, they needed money to push this thing, and nobody was really willing to give them money to. to um, kind of perpetuate and, and um, build this new community. More like the shoes do. So the selling of indulgences was the trigger for Martin Luther's open defiance of the church. His purpose was to draw in contrast to the Bible's teaching with what the church was currently doing. Again, unintentional revolution. Yet no intention of starting it. Protestant means protesting. It doesn't mean revolting. Reformation Basically, it's cleaning, it's reform. Let's just fix this. We've got a problem. Let's clean it up. Let's resolve it. He isn't, is, you know, Protestants aren't Protestant revolutionaries or revolutionary reformers. They're Protestant reformers. I mean, he was a Protestant reformer. It's all he's trying to do. So his 95 thesis can be summed up in two points. One, that the sale of indulgences was exploitative of the economy of the German nation. Uh, Luther accused the Pope of building St. Peter's Basilica out of the skin, flesh, and bones of his sheep. And two, that the Pope had no authority over purgatory. And even if he did, forcing people to pay their way out was contrary to Christian charity. Luther not only challenged the doctrine of indulgences, but the whole sacred conception of salvation. So at first, Pope Leo initially saw the 95 Thesis as a dispute between Augustinian and Dominican monks. It was a theological argument between clergy, something that happens all the time. It was an in house debate, not worth the Pope's time. However, soon Pope Leo was forced to get involved and he did not hold back. On June 15, 1520, he issued a papal decree condemning Luther as a heretic, who at that time, a heretic's uh, punishment was death at the stake. And Luther, Luther continued to defy the Pope and continued his, his crusade. Uh, his goal was more than the protest of the Pope. It would be a positive and constructive renewal of the church. Again, not revolution, but renewal. So it wraps up essentially with the Diet of Worms 1521. This has nothing to do with food. Diet is just the name of a type of council, and Worms is literally a city of Germany, so just by chance, you think of it as Council of Phoenix. That's all it means. The council spread out Luther's writings in the imperial chamber. There was such a pile, he was such a prolific writer, 
that Charles V of his aides expressed doubt as to whether any single person could have even ever written as much as they had in front of him. Luther was asked publicly to recant, take it back, come home, get over it, whatever. To confess openly his mistakes about the gospel, the nature of the church, and the current state of Christian. After a day of deliberation, he responded, quote, Therefore, I ask by the mercy of God, may your most serene majesty, most illustrious lordships, or anyone at all who is able, either high or low, bear witness. Expose my errors, overthrowing them by the writings of prophets and the evangelists. So I say, prove it. You know, like, just show me that I'm wrong. Once I have been taught, I shall be quite ready to renounce every error, and I shall be the first to cast my books into the fire. So he's saying, prove it. He's also saying, I'm right, you're wrong, suck it. I'm not going anywhere. The emperor spokesman pressed him further, to which replied, quote, Since then, your serene majesty and your lordships seek, seek a simple answer, I will give it in this manner, neither horn nor tooth, meaning straightforward. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures, or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is held captive to the word of God. I cannot, and I will not, retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. And he finishes, here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Luther had no intention of breaking off from the church. He firmly believed that nothing good could be achieved through schism. But regrettably, following his 1520 excommunication and then his condemnation by the Stadium Worms in 1521, his ruled out any possibility of reconciliation. He left the church. Many people followed him, including priests and, and the like. I mean, there were clergy that went with him. They founded a new church that would eventually be called, you know, known after him, named after him, um, Lutheranism. Um, and, and like I said, four months after he started this new church, he got married. So I was then he went, oh, yeah, well, clergy, we can marry too. So that's kind of how that started. Oh, oops. All right. So that really came out funky. So what did the Protestant Reformation do? In some, it challenged the established authority and secured the triumph of secular power. That is, the power of non-Christian uh, leaders. And we're going to really see how here in a second. It shaped identities and changed the map of Europe. Literally, it really drew the map. Um, it contributed to centuries of violent conflicts, specifically between Christians, between Catholics and Protestants. Um, and it contributed to an ascendancy of individualism. Why? Because here we have Martin Luther, an individual, deciding his, you know, the salvation of his soul. It wasn't up to, to a group, it wasn't up to the church, it wasn't up to anybody but him. And by him deciding, and other people deciding, well, I choose Luther's church to the Catholic church, to Christ church, then that is a level of individualism that can be carried out for anybody. So what began as an attempt to reform the practices of the Catholic Church evolved into a fight for freedom. Uh, oh wait, this is kind of redundant. Is there, how did I not notice that? Okay, that's a little redundant. That, that, this is the last one. Alright, so what say you? Martin Luther felt so strongly about his position with these church practices that he accepted his excommunication by leaving the church. What are other instances of people or groups leaving an organization due to such strongly held beliefs? A. B. Have you ever felt so passionately about something that you felt compelled to leave a group or organization? Social distance have the neighbors. Like you said, go. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. 
I'll take a seven. I will literally take a seven o'clock or seven p.m. or seven a.m. Like cancel. The strange thing is that I have lag bars and then I have your phones. Yeah, that's intense. and nothing in between. So uh, what is your topic now? Yeah. What's your seven a.m. English? Not the most exhilarating yeah. course. Yeah. What are you guys doing right now? I'm just writing a paper about a certain topic. That's all. Yeah. yeah. What what is your English class is? It's English 106. 106. Okay. It's the second semester for French. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. What topic are you writing about? Uh, I think uh, online friends are real friends. Oh, it's fascinating. Huh. Are they? I mean, I have a girlfriend that's one. That was one. So wait, you did what now? I had a girl. I have a girlfriend that was one. Okay, so she developed her online friend to a real friend. Yeah. Okay. That's a great. That's a very interesting question. So that was something that the teacher offered. You know, choose. Or you yeah. Okay. Choose. Very cool. How about you, Matt? How's your? Um, I was up since like eight thirty. So I have a nine nine a.m. I don't know why. Then I practice. Then I finish. Yeah, you know, work out as well. Yeah. Thursday is my my busy day. Busy day. It's awesome. What do you bench? Uh, I haven't benched in a while. Oh, I can probably do it. Two twenty. Yeah, I I forgot a workout yesterday. Four hundred euro. Yeah, COVID really took all the motivation to, to go to the gym. Oh, I didn't even need COVID to be unmotivated. I hate the gym. There's the working out is most boring than it. I can't. I just can't do it. I have to be pushed. In. No, you're like you're like walking to this gym and you see a giant guy with cheese puffs and a favorite movie's on. Maybe it's a bar. Yeah, exactly. Oh, true, it's a true story. But it's I'd rather do anything other than car. So a funny thing is, of all working out, cardio is my favorite because I feel like I'm actively doing something. Whereas like benching, curls, squats, they're just like redundant annoyances that I, that I don't like doing. The other thing though is that I don't like doing cardio either. So it's, <laughs> there's a reason I have forgotten. I definitely you like to look twice. It's, uh, it's to do. Uh, I do not share that. <laughs> I'm not saying you're wrong. I just don't share that. I'm kissing two guys. Yeah. There's a giant hole in the back, though. Nobody's looking. Who's looking in the back? <laughs> oh, oh, I did that. Yeah, but funny because said there's a giant hole in the back. <laughs> That's the joke right there. I like your sweater. Yeah, it's fine. It's just a giant hole in the neck. All right, so I, I am always curious. Have any of you guys ever felt so compelled 
you know, felt so passionate about something to compel to leave a group or, or an organization or anything like that. I mean, I could be like quitting work. Yeah, Joanna, like what happened? Um, for me, I guess it's kind of dramatic. Um, I was in like this like youth group at my church, and we got into like an argument about human rights, and I was super passionate about it. And I kind of you're kind of for of human rights. Them. They were against it. Like, <laughs> no, essentially, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I gave them my two cents and then I blocked the whole program and I went somewhere else. Bafflation. <laughs> well, good for you. There, there's your uh, Martin Luther phone. Erica, you seem like you had. <laughs> yeah, I was telling them that so my first semester that I spent over here, um, I was like, well, I'm going to start like, meeting people. And so, and my, so my friend that I knew, he introduced me to like, these like, mentors. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, there were different people like making. They came off their all their debt, this and that, all that stuff. I was like, okay, I want to do that too. And then, like, three and half the two months. Then, halfway through, I think it was like two months in, like, going to all the meetings, I got a security team. So, oh I was, my like, gosh. So, like, let them know if they Oh, those things are so stupid. Yeah. I have a relative who got involved with one of the shirts, and, you know, you. You would talk to, to this person, you'd think, pretty smart, like intelligent. And then they got into this and was adamant about its effectiveness. And, and you know, if I just get a couple of people to work beneath me, then I don't have to work in the world. And it's like, dude, that's a freaking pyramid scheme. You're, it's yeah. not smart, man. Like, but he was, uh, I didn't mean to share gender, but whatever. He was, all, I think he actually still is a part of it, but dude, you know, real job. <laughs> Anybody else? I I did quit a job once that I loved. Like I loved this job for I don't know why I'm pointing up to Martin Luther. It was my Martin Luther moment, is basically what I'm referencing. But like loved this job. But the people that worked above me were some of the most immoral, you know, like conniving, distrustful, self-interested people I've ever, ever, ever known. And so far I've never met in any other field of anywhere near them. It kind of pains me that I had to quit even to this day. Um, the only detail I'll share is I, you know, I'm financially fine here, but they were paying me a lot. I was doing well. It was not a pyramid scheme too. This was like a legitimate career. I, 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 know, like I had to leave and it sucked so bad. It really did. Because um, I really loved, I loved the jobs. The people were just terrible. All right, then, uh, what are other instances of people or groups leaving an organization due to such strongly held beliefs in world history? What are some other, yeah, just others? Confederacy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, they're fighting for something really poor, but they, you know, their idea of self-governance and um, states' rights, really, really big deal. What else? Uh, like the white army versus the red army during the communists. So, so you're speaking to the white army? Yeah. Like the white army versus the red army when the revolution was going on. Or you're speaking of China, correct? No, they're in, in Soviet Union. Oh, Russia. Okay. Yeah. You're referencing something that I'm not fully. Okay, so what you're talking about the white army breaking off from the red army. Yeah. Just Okay, so obviously the Red Army is the communist army. Yeah. It's like, it was, and actually it was kind of a, and the reason why I said that uh, China's, China has, has a Red Army too, but um, the um, revolutionaries, it was basically Stalin's military, if you will, political military. And so the White Army that was from yeah. off. Yeah, okay. What else? People, other events in history, people felt so strongly they had to leave something, just. Didn't like Brexit happen two years ago? Or yeah, I don't know. I don't know where. <laughs> so, so there's obviously the European Union, um, which is a 13 nations of our call, and England is or had been one of them. So they held a referendum, where it was a national vote. It was an extraordinarily, um, you know, it was watched worldwide because the question was, okay, if Europe, if England leaves the European Union, then what happens to both England? And the European Union, England is kind of a big deal, and so they held this national referendum, and the Brexiters, 
the let's leave the European Union and, and remain more independent um, won out by a very slim margin, but a victory nonetheless. And so, yeah, that was a big deal. It was particularly a big deal because the prime minister had to step down because the prime minister was anti-Brexit and then was forced to try to deal with the Brexiters. So then they, they stepped down and then eventually the Brexit leader, uh, whose name is escaping me, became prime minister. He was voted as prime minister for him to help. And it still isn't complete. That was, that was four years ago, three or four years ago. So, but, you know, that was... That is definitely like a okay. Let's we're sick of the European Union, and uh, so it's kind of a revolutionary thought. Very good. Any, any else? Thank you. Well, I mean, obviously there are a hundred other examples, but yeah, Justin brought up the Confederacy. It was like he left out the American Revolution. <laughs> I was like, both correct. You weren't incorrect, but I would think that most generally people would pick the American Revolution over the Confederacy. But yes. Yes, uh, Emma. Oh yeah, Emma Watson Hunter. Okay. Again, I didn't see your plaque. Anybody else? Any others? All right, very good. So those are all, if you will. Actually, I should add the hashtag Martin Luther moments in history. All right. So the Protestant Reformation obviously began with Martin Luther in Germany and extended. Uh, into France, which we'll get here in a second. But kind of the big, the next big one. Oh, I, I I hit a button. The next big one. Oh, that freezes. Oh, I froze. Oh, shoot. My bad. Okay, there we go. Uh, but the next big one was with England. So the most impressive example of the expansion of power due to the Reformation, uh, and the expansion of monarchical power, was that of King Henry VIII, and I'm not talking just his waistband, I'm talking like actual physical, well, actual you know, power. Henry's desire for a male heir uh, to the throne led to a complete break with the Catholic Roman Church when it rejected his marriage and Roman petition. So just kind of a little bit of background. The Catholic Church, you are not allowed to get divorced. And the reason is very, very simple. The Catholic Church sees the uh, act of marriage as sacramental. It is one of the very important aspects of the faith is that of marriage. Essentially, you're kind of supposed to either get married or enter the clergy, either become a priest or a nun. You're to marry God kind of in, in that essence, one way or the other. It's not like you're wrong if you don't get married or enter the clergy, but that's kind of like, those are kind of the two big encouragements. So both of which are sacraments. Well, the sacrament of marriage, it's not just a, well, okay, so what makes the sacrament so important is the vow. It's the vow of devotion. And it's a lifeline, lifetime devotion to your new husband or wife. But it isn't just a devotion of two. It's a devotion of three. And it's not a vow between two. It's a vow between three. And that third is God. And so you cannot break a vow with God. You, I mean, otherwise, what was the point of making that vow in the first place? It's a false promise. So the idea of committing the or entering the act of the commitment of marriage, it's an act and commitment of being married to your spouse and God, recreating the Holy Trinity in that sense. So it is a very, very important thing. Hence why you can't have a divorce, because you can't divorce God. Um, and so you're, it's like, okay, if you're having problems, figure them out. You know, like you're supposed to have entered this out of love in the first place. So thus... Use your love to resolve your issues. You can, however, get an annulment. It is difficult, but plausible. The thing about an annulment, though, is traditionally one of the two partners had to have entered with a lie. You know, either the person really didn't, you know, person A really didn't love person B, faked it, and was trying to use the other person for, say, money, wealth, prestige, that kind of thing. That's a really big lie if person B thought that person A loved them. Uh, also, like, say person A says, I'll, when we get married, I'll convert to Catholicism, you know, and then they get married, and person A goes, screw that, I'm not going to convert, you know, I don't care, blah, blah, blah. Well, obviously, person B entered this thinking my spouse was going to, you know, follow my 
walk of Christ with me, and now they're blowing. You know, that's that's grounds for an annulment petition. Not being able to have a kid is not grounds for petition of annulment. So when King Henry VIII said, I want a moment, get me out of this thing so I can go find another wife, the Pope said, no, that's not how it works. You can't just break a vow with God simply because your wife isn't having a boy or having children to your liking. So because Martin Luther had already kicked off the Reformation and uh, King Henry VIII saw that, hey, really, it only takes one individual to say, get me out of here, he said, let's go. And he took a country with him. So that leads us to the English Reformation. So that came to pass in 1534, 14 years after Martin Luther's 795 Thesis. The English Act of Supremacy is passed by Parliament, where Parliament says, I'm going to read the bread. Parliament says, albeit the king's majesty, majesty justly and rightfully is and ought to be the supreme head of the Church of England. And so is recognized by the clergy of this realm in their convocations. Yet, nevertheless, for corroboration and confirmation thereof, and for increase of virtue in Christ's religion within the realm of England, and to repress and extirp all errors, heresies, and other enormities and abuses heretofore used in the same, be it enacted by authority of this present parliament, that the king, our sovereign lord, his heirs and successors, kings of this realm, shall be taken, accepted, and reputed, the only supreme head in earth of the Church of England, called in uh, Anglicana, uh, shoot, Anglicana, Anglicana Ecclesia. I don't know why I couldn't get that word out. Anglicana Ecclesia. By the way, this is one sentence. <laughs> This is like the world's longest run on. They really just, they threw in a whole bunch of uh, uh, semicolons, but still, it's still part of a single sentence. So that's one bloody sentence. So, anyway, so here's the parliament affirming King Henry VIII's power over religion of his people, forming a new church, forcing all former Catholic priests of the realm to now be Anglican priests, all so he could get a divorce. How did it work out for him? Well, he got his heir. His first wife, Catherine of Aragon, then the key as the new pope of the church. And by the way, the king and queen are still pope or popus of the Church of England. So right now, Queen Elizabeth he is for the Church of England in the same position as the Pope of the Catholic Church. Um, because of King Henry. So Catherine of Aragon, her marriage, their marriage is annulled because the king decreed it. Uh, she died, however, while detained under guard at Kimbleton Castle. Uh, she is the mother of Mary I. Anne Boylan, uh, her, that marriage was annulled. Unfortunately, she was then beheaded uh, and uh, is the mother of Elizabeth I. So really, the guy who's just going to murder his wives, so I want to put him in charge of the church, but okay. Jane Seymour died 12 days after giving birth to Edward VI, who is believed that her death was believed to be caused by birth complications. Um, and so he finally did get his heir. It took three tries when he got there. Anne of Cleves, their marriage was annulled. Uh, however, she outlived the rest of the wives. And then Catherine Parr was widowed at death by Henry VIII and remarried, uh, became remarried to Thomas of Seymour. So he got his one male heir, so he could have a king. Uh, but it took three tries and he got six marriages out of it. So the Church of England was thus established by Henry VIII to give to the monarch control over ecclesiastical all religious affairs in England and the realm of life. Another example of a subsequent loss of power by the monarch, however, was Charles V of the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, who was the Holy Roman Empire of uh, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which, by the way, is, it was a series of territories and, and nations that all fell under this this singular emperor's uh, rule. There were kings, though, for each of these. So Germany, for instance, Austria, um, so on, Bohemia, so on and so forth. So it's actually a fascinating, if you ever want to look into it, it's a fascinating kind of construction of government until the government. Until the government. So as a result of the Peace of Oxford in 1555, Charles surrendered, the monarch Charles surrendered his rights to choose the church 
for the German people. In addition, many of the newly converted Protestant monarchs of the Holy Roman Empire uh, converted, uh, excuse me, enjoyed assuming control of Catholic church property and revenue, provided themselves with huge new swaths of power. Prior to the Reformation, Pope, excuse me, kings had power over much of your daily life. Certainly economics, politics, war, that kind of thing. But they didn't have power over your faith. Now, kings were granting themselves power over their subjects' faith, giving them whole new aspects of power that never existed in the past. So further effects in France, those politically opposed to the throne allied themselves with religious dissenters known as the Huguenots. This led to a multi-year civil war throughout France, although the nation will remain predominantly Catholic, although they are very weak practicing. Um, in England, as the offspring of King Henry VIII struggled for control of the throne, the new Church of England continued to prove to persevere through these tumultuous times, and they are still Anglican, they are still part of the Church of England to this day. In Ireland, the English ruling class adopted the Church of England, but the, the Irish people predominantly remain as part of the Catholic Church. Um, they too still remain a Catholic nation, although their level of practice I evidence mean, diminished to almost zero. Uh, in the German states, the northern states were largely Lutheran, while the southern states remained Roman Catholic. So to wrap it up, the consequences of the Protestant Revolution. Uh, one, it destroyed religious unity of Europe. Prior to the Revolution, if you were Christian, you were Catholic. You granted this, just that's all it was. Catholic, by definition, means universal. So it was Christ's universal church. Well, now, where there might have been disunity among language, disunity among political ideas, war, that kind of, um, excuse me, not war, but, um, you know, like, uh, regional uh, differences that might lead to war. They all at least shared the union of the church. That no longer occurred, which led to further war. Catholics and Protestants of Europe war against each other for centuries. Um, to it further the growth of the modern secular and centralized states, uh, which actually has led to, by contrast, a lessening in Christianity on this planet. It contributed to great growth of political liberty. Um, while acts of monarchy was an immediate beneficiary uh, to the Reformation and indirect Protestantism, which is another feature of the modern West, Protestantism accomplished uh, political liberty by providing religious justification for revolution against tyrannical rule, specifically by the Great Awakening in the 1730s. That Protestants didn't generally overthrow their, their pastors. Until the 1730s, people felt like if my pastor isn't getting me to heaven, I need to kick him out. I need to find someone who is. And so all of a sudden, in the, uh, the North American continent in England, people were literally throwing their pastors out and kicking them the curb, going, I need someone who's going to save my life, love or soul. Well, because of that, all of a sudden, people are practicing kicking out levels of authority that had never been questioned before. And then 30 years later, 40 years later, it would lead to the American Revolution, where people kicked out their country or their government like had never been done before. Four, it advanced the idea of equality. Uh, for instance, Martin Luther held that there was no spiritual distinction between the lay and the clergy, that there was spiritual equality of all believers. Um, I don't know at what point that returned, like how disparate it was during this time of the Catholic Church, but today, I mean, it stands the same in the Catholic Church. So at least if, if he accomplished any literal reformation, that would be one. Uh, five, contribute to the creation of the individualistic ethic for all the races I just said. I mean, if you can start your own church, if you can choose your own Christian path, obviously you've got a level of individualism that hadn't been there before. And finally, it may have contributed to the development of the capitalist spirit. The Reformation's stress on the individual conscience underlies current modern economic life. Okay, I thought it froze better than that. Okay, so looking at our song, it's not due for a lot of days, no stress or pressure. But it's three parts, straightforward, so another chart, fill up the chart. Um, so here's the matrix here to compare the views of thinkers listed, which, so Paul, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you watched the Tuesday lecture, because a lot, I provide a lot of information here. I will do more next week, but I started, I'll give you a lot of information. 
uh, briefly described the four thinkers' views on the source of political legitimacy and the rationale for obedience to government. Then select two thinkers of your own choice and do the same. So you'll do six, but you get to choose your own adventure. You can pick modern thinkers, you can pick ancient thinkers, you can pick um, like politicians, you can pick um, like women's rights activists, anybody who discusses political legitimacy, obedience to government, that kind of thing. Boom, you can use them. It's totally like choose your own, you know, whoever you want. There are some options in the second year reading them. Second part, oh, and these are like 25 to 50 words each block, one citation per row, because presumably you're going to get, you know, kind of information in the same place for, say, Paul, so you don't have to cite twice, just cite once per row. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, all I do is, all I will ask is that, so the, the old, you know, the standard idea is you can't use an encyclopedia. It's got to be salt scholarly uh, stand. Um, so then all I ask is that you just kind of show me at some point, just like, you know, yo, can I use this so I can just guarantee it's authentic? Yeah, okay, cool. that's, that's fine. All right, so then two, or, you know, part two is just two questions. What is the purpose of government? To provide three different views from your matrix here, let me just pull up here and add it to here. And identify the author of each view and your answer. So that's how you'll cite that answer. And then why is political legitimacy number two important? Who or what provides a government with legitimacy? You support from the matrix as well as the court materials, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, course materials, again, which I, you know, my lecture in particular on Tuesday uh, to answer a question. Three or five hundred words each. Again, straight, straightforward. All right, uh, in terms of using the textbook, here are the small digestible chunks. They're literally just a couple of chunks of 15, a couple of chunks of 19. Will really help you get a lot of this information. And then, if you're interested in this topic, so this is now just like extending beyond uh, what we're discussing. So books, documentaries, and, and movies. Here I Stand, A Life of Martin Luther. So it's a biography of Martin Luther. Uh, the Unintended Reformation, How a Religious Revolution Secularized Society. Um, Heart of Europe, A History of the Holy Roman Empire. Documentaries, uh, Reformation, Europe's Holy War, which is BC Studios, and Martin Luther, German Finds PBS. I believe both of those are free, whereas the Luth of the Life of Legacy of the German Reformer, this is familiar to pay, but it's produced. Very, it's like a reflux, I think. But it's like, you, again, if you want to learn more, if you're more interested in this, it's produced very, very well. And then movies on the topic the movie Luther, uh, which is about Martin Luther, and then A Man for All Seasons, 1966. And I'm pretty positive that one in Academy Award for Best Picture. That's a fantastic movie. And then The Seahawk, 1940. Let me just take a tennis we're up. Any questions about the special twitches on any of this right now? So you guys are good. Are you awake? Kind of. Kind of. Who's hungry? Oh my gosh, I can't wait. My wife told me before I left this morning, she goes, okay, I'm making a surprise for dinner. I'm like, really? She goes, I got an idea, I've got to make it. Okay. I can't wait. No idea. Uh, Amy? Caleb, Dara, Emma, Erica, Faith, and just a reminder: make sure that you take the placards. Just don't, please don't forget, Garrett. Jack, uh, yeah, Jack, here. I saw Jack and Jake for a second. That was a second. Sorry. I saw Jake. Here. Jake. Joanna. Here. Justin. Here. Kiona. Uh, Madison. Matt, you. Oh, so Dylan or Boyd? Diamond. Boyd. Oh, Diamond. Okay, so then is, is Dylan or Boyd in here? Okay, just Diamond. Okay. It's crazy. Read Matt. Um, Nathan? Noah? Here. Here. Oscar? 
uh, Simon, Sydney, Tara, Taylor. Did I not call anybody? All right, any questions, comments, stories, special please for you. I love you all. Have a great weekend. Be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Let me know if you need anything. Avoid COVID at all costs. Get the vaccine. Unless you don't want it, then just avoid COVID at all costs. <laughs> Yeah, you're supposed to do both notes and what's in Oh, yeah. Okay. Point, can you enter that field without an internship? Just a degree? Yeah, I can enter an internship. Okay.